Ah, yes, and we are recording. So I'll say welcome again to uh, Grading for Learning, a, an experience report about using standard-based grading in an intermediate Java course. Um, and um, I forgot what I was going to say. Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, how many of you recognize that um, some students are just taking classes as a sort of a gamification? They're just there to get points so they can get an A. Uh, and they don't really, it doesn't look like they really feel like they really care about the material. For them, it's just a matter of getting points so they can get an A and move on to the next uh, class and not really about uh, gathering uh, skills or uh, abilities to go and, and do stuff with the, with the knowledge that they have. How many recognize that? And some hands up and Good. a few reactions. So then, then this presentation is for you. Yeah, so the course that this was applied to was CISC 191. It's intermediate Java. The first time that we taught it at Mesa actually was last fall. And because of COVID, it ended up being in a remote synchronous format. So I was meeting with students six hours a week via Zoom as a lot. Um, but Alan and I co-developed this course. We actually started planning it back in fall of 2019 under the assumption that everything would get approved all the way up and down the line through curriculum at the state. And then we started designing it uh, with a bit more detail in spring of 2020. And we really wanted to make sure that we used open educational resources. And we actually applied to Mosaic and were accepted into it in fall 2020. So we were designing the course as, as we were teaching it. Yeah, so we had um, we, we essentially had two goals in this. One was to make a class where uh, we were only using open educational resources so that the cost of the class was as low as possible. And the other one was to give real meaning to equity in grading. Um, we recognize that the word equity is thrown around quite a bit these days, but we wanted to make sure that in this class or, or try to in this class give it real meaning in how we actually um, executed on the class, how we delivered the class. So the first thing is, uh, or the first and the main thing of that was to only evaluate students on demonstrated proficiency. So that means that um, we would not uh, have any deadlines, obviously the end of class is a deadline, but beyond that, it would be up to the students themselves uh, to uh, show their proficiency to us. And, um, and we would allow them to show it multiple times and at multiple levels such that they could see a nice progression in, in their skills. Uh, the idea was that um, we did not expect and we do not expect uh, that everything will be perfect the first time so that we could uh, allow the students to um, not only resubmit but also like uh, they could start out, maybe they thought they had some skills in an area and then they could go and try out those skills and find out, well, maybe I need to go and read some more. And then they could try at a lower level and then they would succeed there and then they could go back and try at a higher level. And the other piece was uh, we wanted this to be fun. So we wanted to put in uh, project-based learning and um, use it on things that they could recognize from the real world. One of, the, uh, one of the winning combinations here is this idea of um, creative problem solving. So by giving students the tools and then giving them some problems that they can use the tools on, um, that gives them a, feel of, uh, a, sense, uh, a feeling of accomplishment. And then uh, the last piece we would, do into, uh, we would add into that was, was to have something where the students felt that they were also learning how to learn. In other words, what is a successful strategy when I am learning some dense, complicated technical material? Um, how do I best approach um, a problem? And how can I uh, sort of maximize my time um, studying? Now, a lot, of, uh, a lot of this came out of the following book. And so I picked up a copy of Grading for Equity and I read it and at first, when I was reading, I was going, ah, oh, you know, these are things they say. And then I really started thinking about it. And I started thinking about what have my grading practices been 
in the past. And do I feel like that is an accurate reflection of what students learned? And so I thought about it and I thought about it and I looked at some of the suggestions and there's a lot of suggestions in this book, right? Some of the suggestions in the book say, hey, you know, just change your grading scale a little bit, right? There's small things that you can do. There's big things you can do. And I said, hey, Alan and I are designing this brand new course. We're starting from the ground up. Let's go all the way. Let's go straight to standards-based grading. And so we, we designed the course around many of the suggestions in this book. And everybody's asking me to hold it up. It's actually on the other side of the room. <laughs> There's a picture of it on the screen, you guys. <laughs> Sorry, Tasha. <laughs> it's okay. They're, they're used to me, like, every time somebody mentions the book, I just lean down and pick it up and hold it up. Anyway, it, this book really changed the way that I approach grading and look at grading. And so we're looking at what is equitable? How do we get students back to that point where, I mean, remember when you were five? and everything was new and exciting and learning things was lots of fun, right? And it wasn't like, okay, what do I have to do for class now? What do I get to do? Oh boy, I get to go do this, right? And that's where we wanna to try to get students back to. So, so um, we, we sort of came from two different perspectives, but we ended up at the, the same place. Um, I tell the story about how uh, young people um, students come into kindergarten or first grade and they're little sponges for knowledge and they want to know everything and they want to learn and they ask a million questions a second and they're really just taking in the world and then by the time they get to uh, 11 or 12th grade they could not care less about school and really just want to get out of there and never want to come back and the question was uh, what changed um, and much of the conclusion to that is it's because we changed why they were going to school. So with the introduction of grades, we're moving them from being intrinsically interested and motivated to go and explore the world to being measured on an extrinsic scale. And all that matters is what grade did you get? It has nothing to do with skill or interest or ability or uh, creative uh, um, yeah, creative instinct, but it has everything, everything you're measured on is an extrinsic measure. And we think that that's ruined a lot of, um, or certainly hasn't helped in motivating students. So um, once we made the leap into saying the only thing we care about is standard based grading, then we started to design the course backwards. <laughs> um, that sounds all wrong, but the idea is we did not do it backwards but we did it from the back forward. In other words, we started out with the learning objectives and different levels within them. And then we developed different activities uh, to assess the proficiency of the student in each concept. Um, so we somewhat was inspired by Bloom's taxonomy. I'm sure most people know that one. Um, and the, at the lowest levels, we were just looking for remembering and sort of basic understanding. And for that, we, we have used uh, multiple choice quizzes. Uh, when it came to applying uh, the knowledge, we give the students a specific program challenges that they have to uh, fulfill. And these are very strongly prompted. In other words, we give them, uh, how put this? We give them the output from the programs and then they have to design the programs to, to fit that output. So they're very um, specific, very regimented. And then uh, the next two levels of Bloom's taxonomy are uh, analyze and evaluate. And what we ask the students to do is to explain the concepts in a video. So make a screencast where you explain um, this concept for yourself and <laughs> as a side effect to us. It's really not for us. It's really for them to explain it to themselves so that they know that they understand and can explain the concept. And for I the- I wanna jump in on about yeah, those videos ahead. also students post this in a discussion forum and other students watch them and write a review. So part of the assignment is actually reviewing two other students' videos. And so students learn a lot from each other, right? Because beginners explain things in a different language than experts. And so they can actually explain things to each other a lot better than we can explain things to them sometimes. 
And so having those videos, it's just more resources that students can use as they're trying to level up essentially. And the, yes, and the final uh, two levels is about evaluating and, and, and creating. So this is the levels where uh, you have enough uh, independent and confidence to actually go and build something for yourself. And this is where we pull, pull in um, projects and we allow the students to decide on for themselves what kind of projects they want to do, uh, obviously subject to approval. But, uh, but the idea here being is that they find something that they're interested in. And then we make a project out of it where, where they then go and use those concepts that they that they've just learned. You're muted. <laughs> All right, I, I was muted. I've got a heater running here that's pretty loud, so I want to spare you that when I'm not talking. Um, but a little more uh, detail about how we actually implemented the standards-based grading in the course. Is, as Alan said, we came up with our learning outcomes first, and we ended up with 10 learning outcomes. Now, this was um, based a little bit on the course outline of record that was on Curriculum, but um, you may have noticed for some of your courses that those um, those learning outcomes aren't always the most helpful for students. And so we took a look at everything that was supposed to be covered in the course, as well as the learning outcomes. And we distilled it down to 10 learning outcomes that we really wanted students to focus on. And then within each learning outcome, we had the four different levels. And we decided rather than calling them one, two, three, and four, we'd give them a little bit more interesting names. So Sticking with the computer science theme, we went from intern to junior developer to middle developer to senior developer, similar to what students might experience in a job. And we figured that might also help them to, to think about, oh yeah, that's right, even when I get to a job, I'm going to be learning. And um, we re, uh, relisted here on this slide what it was that we did at each level. Um, Alan talked about that on the last slide. But it was really key to us that unlimited resubmissions are allowed. Right? Learning's not linear. Everybody learns at their own pace. Does it matter to us if somebody learns a concept in week two of the course versus if they learn it in week 14 of the course? As long as they learn it by the time that we need to finish grading and turn in grades, we don't think that it should make a difference in their grade. And so unlimited resubmissions were allowed. Now, Alan said no deadlines. Um, we distinguished between the word deadline and the word due date. So deadline for us meant everything had to be turned in. That was the end of the term, you know, grades are due. But due dates were recommended dates by which students turn in work. That way we have something we can say, hey, you know, you didn't get this turned in by the due date, you're falling behind in the course. And students have something that says, hey, this is where I should be at different points in the course. Um, and then Another key component for the course is that at the end of each module, and um, each module roughly corresponded to one learning outcome, but at the end of each module, we asked students to write a reflection. So they reflected on the course concepts, but they also reflected on their learning process and the outcome of their learning process. And we asked them to make one suggestion of something that they were going to do differently in the next module to improve their learning. And I had a lot of students who said to me, wow, this is the first time that anybody's ever tried to help me learn how to learn. And so students really appreciated that. Um, I see that Kelly's asking in the chat, did we did I end up with a deluge of grading at the end of the semester? Um, from some students, but I was really good about making sure to be on top of reminding students that they had more work that they needed to do, that they needed to turn other things in. And also um, for the projects that got students to the senior developer level, um, the projects were not eligible to demonstrate senior developer proficiency unless they had previously demonstrated middle developer proficiency. So if they wanted to get to that A, because senior developer roughly corresponds to an A, if they wanted to get to that A, they needed to be doing the work in the meantime and previously show that they had uh, gained a certain level of proficiency. Yeah, we did we did have a, a lot of conversations about what, how do we make sure that people are progressing and how do we make sure that people aren't taking shortcuts? Um, one of the big questions that came up, um, this is an example of one of the, the modules, um, 
one of the questions that we frequently discussed was how do we avoid plagiarism? In other words, how do we prevent uh, students uh, from essentially borrowing somebody else's work and turning it in? And we, we sort of took the attitude that uh, the intern level, which is the quiz, there's just enough questions in there that you can try it over and over and over again. And if you have to, that's fine. Um, it's okay. Uh, maybe you will learn from that by, by answering all those questions, you will actually learn the material. And if you think that's more fun than studying, then you know, be our guest. Um, for the, uh, for the uh, middle, um, sorry, the junior developer, in this case, it's also a quiz, but it would generally be a, uh, like this one, a, a programming challenge. Uh, so it's theoretically possible that, um, you know, somebody could um, borrow somebody else's work and turn it in. We do encourage the student to collaborate and work together. Uh, and as soon as they, and as long as they cite each other and say, hey, I work with this person or I work with this mentor or whatever, that's perfectly fine um, for any number of reasons, but also specifically because we believe that collaboration is a 21st century skill that specifically people that work with computers need to learn. Um, but the real catch is that when they have to produce the video, uh, that is where uh, Robert meets Road. And the idea is that they will use the code that they have produced in the earlier challenges or activities um, and demonstrate that they understand the skills uh, needed to make that code. In other words, they have to explain the concept and they have to explain um, how that code works that they are actually submitting. So if we get to this point and they can't explain the code, well, then there's a strong case to be made that we need to go back to a, a previous level, <clears throat> excuse me, and then work through the code again in order to get the knowledge necessary to get to the senior level. Um, and you can see here's the reflection on um, generic collections and data structures. The, the last piece and the piece that uh, we didn't get to here is that uh, the senior level um, developer was in the project. So that was sort of taken out of each module. So you'll see here that, uh, sorry. Yeah, in this particular case, obviously bad example. Uh, we're using the senior developer uh, level activities here. But the idea is that that level goes into um, a higher a, a situation where you have multiple concepts that, that the students are learning and they have to learn when to use a concept and when not to use it and also how to put them together. In other words, how to compose different concepts to make a, a full solution. Um, and we had some really good, or there are some really good examples of students doing that in projects. So now you probably want to know, well, how, how did this actually work? Okay, so here's my statistics. At Census, I had 33 students enrolled in the course. Um, our course cap was set at 40. So there were, there were a few students who said, hey, I didn't even realize that this had synchronous meeting times. A few students who didn't want to do the work or for whatever reason, they dropped. But after census, I had five students who withdrew and these students pretty much just stopped showing up immediately at census. I think you've probably all had some students like that in your class as well. Um, I had one student who reached the end of the term and failed. Um, he stopped showing up just before sort of the midterm part, um, but then was sh uh, still submitting some work and showing some progress on our midterm project and did not want to withdraw. So that's, that's what ended up happening. But that's pretty good, I think. One student, only one student failing. Um, so what that means is 75% of the students who enrolled at census succeeded. This was during COVID. And this may not sound great to some of you. You may have some great success rates in your department. But if we look in the CISC department, we have relatively low success rates. Uh, we have a 62% success rate across all of the courses in our department. So 75% is really good compared to what we see in other courses. And then to top this off, 68% of students demonstrated A-level proficiency. Okay? And you might look at this and you might say, wow, this looks like great inflation. But really what it is, is we set some high standards before the course even started. Right? We developed our learning objectives. We, we figured out what students needed to do to meet these standards. 
and students aspired to meet these standards and they did it. I was yeah. really proud of them. And, and I want to make sure we, we sort of settle on that. There, there's a tendency for, for people to assume that because we're going to the sort of standards grade and you can just sort of uh, move the curve a little bit, that is not what we did. We set high standards and I have zero doubts about how high those standards are. Um, the idea being that if we set the standards ahead of time, we won't be, um, how should I put this, we won't be <laughs> tempted to go easier later. In other words, like the standards were set at the beginning. So you can't, you can't get by, for instance, in, on the intern level, you have to answer every answer, sorry, every question correct in the quiz. It wasn't like, oh, I could get a 90 or something. No, you had to answer everything correct because otherwise you don't have the skills at that level. And the same thing with the programming assignments or the programming challenges, that there is a series of tests that the program has to pass. And if it doesn't pass, you are not get you're, you're you're not at that level yet. So therefore, you have to go back and modify your program until it actually passes all those tests. And then we can confidently say you are at that intern or the uh, junior developer level. And the same thing for the video that once they got to that level and, and could explain things, then we can confidently say we have, you know, subjective evidence that uh, the students have actually proven that they can uh, both explain and use a certain concept. And I will say I had a few students explaining the same sort of subtopic within a concept three or four times in a video before they finally explained it correctly and demonstrated that they knew it. So I, mean, I was not an easy grader by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Kelly was asking, what, it, what was A-level proficiency? So we had 10 learning outcomes. And within each of those learning outcomes, students could uh, earn a score. Well, they all started with zero, but essentially a zero to four scale. Um, to earn an A in the course, they had to demonstrate four on at least nine of the 10 learning outcomes. We decided we'll give them one learning outcome that they can have some wiggle room, but even that just doesn't, it doesn't feel quite right to me. It's like, well, now we're saying, okay, there's one thing you don't have to learn in the course. And, and I don't like that message, but at the same time, I understand life happens. And so we did decide on that um, flexibility. Um, was there a rubric associated with each level? Yes, we had a huge rubric, a, a list of the different outcomes, a list of the different levels, and what they should be able to do at each level. And we provided that to students in um, module zero. Um, can we share the rubric? Um, I'll pull that up so that we can put it on screen a little bit. It's not in the slides, but um, Alan, do we want to go to the next screen? Yeah, in the let's meantime? go to the next one. So here's what students said, right? I mean, I, you've heard a little bit about what I thought as an instructor, but I asked students for feedback at the end of the term. And here's what they said. So I'll let Alan read those while I go dig up the rubric. Thank you. <laughs> the fact that there were no due dates, which is not true, there were due dates, but no deadlines, and that we can resubmit encouraged me to actually focus on learning instead of meeting deadlines. Um, for me, the easiest part about uh, the course is having such a flexible grading scheme. I feel like it was very fair. In fact, maybe too fair considering there were no deadlines, but it makes, but it makes sense to me that if we prove that we understood the concept in code that we wrote ourselves, then we should have a passing grade for it. So again, uh, the language here about a passing grade is not something, it's not language we use, but I guess it's so ingrained in, in the students uh, that it's difficult to get away from. Overall, I really enjoyed the course. I felt that the professor's grading method was a great way to know how much I had learned and how much I have to learn. In regards to the course, I am just speechless. Your method of teaching is ironclad when it comes to progressing students. And the last one, I did like your grading scheme, though it did take me a little bit to get to fully understand it. It has upped my self-confidence a lot, actually. Uh, I feel better equipped to uh, self-learn code, whether it be Java or, or anything else. I feel that I have developed a workflow that can be applied outside of Java. Yeah, so I did have to explain the translation from uh, different levels to grades to students a few times. And I 
want to point out also that San Diego Unified has mandated that their instructors, that their teachers move to standards-based grading. So very soon we're going to start getting a lot of students coming in who are used to standards-based grading and don't understand the 90 to 100 scale. So just a little incentive to consider changing your, your grading scheme so that students will understand it. Um, I think we have two more slides and then I can yep. share the rubric. So um, my subjective experience here, I saw a lot of increased collaboration between students. They were working together, right? Supporting each other to gain proficiency. Um, they went off and created their own Discord channel and were helping each other a lot. They were using the Zoom room that I had set up for class outside of class hours so that they could do pair programming so that they could help each other learn the material. I saw increased persistence instead of somebody saying, eh, you know, I sort of got it, you know, I, I, I got 70% on that, I, I'm gonna give up, right? They kept continuing, right? They wanted to demonstrate proficiency. And so I didn't really feel like my role was as much of an instructor, uh, so much as like a coach or a cheerleader, right? I was encouraging students, hey, you can do this, keep trying, you know, let's, let's talk about other resources that you might have. And the best part is students actually read the feedback that I gave them and they listened to the feedback and they revised the assignment. If they had an incentive to go back, even though we continued on with new other concepts in the course, if they hadn't completely demonstrated the proficiency in a previous concept, they were still going back and working on it. It wasn't like, okay, that was last week. It was, hey, I still need to learn this material. Um, I did have a slight increase in grading time because of revisions. But the only things that I regraded was the part that they had not yet demonstrated um, correctly on the original submission. So it was really just grade, grade changes on the changes that students submitted on the resubmissions. And the built-in deadline flexibility meant I didn't have to take a look at, hey, can I have an extra day or two, you know, my, my cat threw up type of thing. Um, sorry, Kelly. <laughs> um, but I didn't have to take the time to do that. I didn't have to keep track of it. And it was really nice to have that extra time freed up so that in my interactions with students, I wasn't dealing with sort of bookkeeping requests. I was dealing with helping them actually gain proficiency with the material. Yeah, I've, I've had a, a similar uh, policy in another class for an introductory level class for, for a number of years now. And one of the, so a couple of things that, that stand out in, in these, uh, from students is that you get the feedbacks, like here are the things um, that if you, if you improve your work this way, will get you full points. It's not quite the same as here. Or the ones where, well, at the end of class, they'll look at their points. <laughs> uh, and as much as I don't like saying that, they, they look at their points and go, hey, well, how many points do I need to get an A? And then they'll go back and revise all the all the work, and then generally what they find is, oh, it's so easy now. Like I have progressed so much further, and I, when I look back on my first assignments, oh, they're so easy now, and I can easily get in, you know, full points for all of them. So, um, so it really encourages this. It's really a motivation to the students to fully learn the material. All right, I see we've hit twelve o'clock. We've got. Uh... A conclusion slide that hey focus was on learning and skills not grade and I'm actually I've started taking the time to change the courses I'm teaching next turn into standards based grading. Fortunately they were already closed so it's not too major of an undertaking but I, I can't go back to any other grading scheme after this experience. And uh, one more slide there Helen and then then I promise I'll show you the rubric. Um, so there's a program that we're gonna be doing in the spring called Design to Align, and we'll have some faculty inquiry groups. And so if you are interested in diving in deeper to this, um, you can apply to work on this online course design together. Uh, we'll, I've, I've uh, already started the framework for this uh, faculty inquiry group for reading the Grading for Equity book. The first 10 people will get a free copy of it. And we'll also be taking a look at the assessment section of the OEI rubric so that we can improve our courses. So I encourage you to sign up and uh, Alan put the link in the chat. And so I promised I would share the rubric. So let me share that with you. So here's what our rubric looks like, right? We have our learning outcomes. 
And I know usually rubrics put the higher score over here and the lower score over on the right. And that never made sense to me because it's like we read left to right. So you're improving from left to right. So we, we created the table this way. And so we tell them, hey, this is what you should be able to do at this level, right? This is what you should be able to do at this level, right? We tell them in each level what it is that they should be able to do. And it's, and notice the language here, it's the formulation that you can something. It's not a formal, you know, use polymorphism in a collection class. It's you can, in other words, stressing their abilities. I just want to say, uh, Tasha put in a Herculean <laughs> effort to get to pull all this together. Um, and, and also, like, this looks like a lot of work. It was a lot of work, but we spent a year on it. But that shouldn't discourage anybody from, from going through this process. It really, at the end of it, it really does make your life easier. And it was really fun to design the course with somebody else. And we're, we're also used to just designing our own courses. But I think the course was a lot better because we had a lot of discussions and a lot of debates about what was good and what maybe wasn't so good um, and defining good even. And the great thing about this course is it's so reusable. Okay? We don't even feel that we have to change the assignments. Everything is just reusable as is. So it was a lot of effort to design it now, but it's going to pay off quite a bit as we teach the course. So Alan gets to teach the course in the spring and he'll be doing it asynchronously. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Any questions? I have a quick question. Um, so to get to a C, mm -hmm. did they have to do more than just that intern level? They had to get to the junior developer level in okay. at least nine of the learning outcomes. All right, so they weren't able to, like I was gonna say, like if it was just multiple choice quizzes, I could see most of my students being like, cha-ching. Nope. No, that's, that would be a D level. Okay. And that was, that was part of the other reason why we said, you know, it's not a problem for it to be a multiple choice quiz that they can take multiple times because if they figure out a way to cheat that quiz, they've gotten a D, right? They haven't even passed the class yet. More questions? So, so one of the things uh, for, for the spring um, is that, um, learn we learn too <laughs> so uh, one of the things that's uh, probably going to change is that you have to submit meaningful work on all modules so you can't just skip one and say i'm not going to do that one and then still get an a so you have to participate in all of them and if you look at this this is not the language i would use uh, in front of students but it's sort of a minimum metric in other words you have to meet the minimum floor level and as soon as you walk above that it doesn't matter how high you go above that but as soon as you meet the minimum floor, your grade goes up. But it's not how high you can get, it's the minimum that, you, that you're at. That's the general idea. Let's see if I can find out um, here. Um, yeah, I can, I can share that. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Here we go. Like, so here are the grades. Oops, sorry. Apparently I can't do that. There we go. So um, the idea being that um, you know you have to have a proficiency level four in nine out of ten, but you must submit work for all the learning outcomes in order to get a passing grade. Other questions. In fact, one of the things that we worked a lot on was to come up with these learning outcomes and get um, a meaningful set because the way that they were formulated in the course outline was not really useful for the students and it was difficult to formulate in a way that here are some actual skills you can, you can achieve and then you can prove that you have them, you can show your proficiency and then we can you know, get you um, a proficiency level for that because of the way that the, the language was and the learning outcomes, et cetera. But also we did do uh, some folding where, um, like for instance, uh, the last one here includes more than just multiple threads. It does include a couple of other topics, but they're all related and therefore put into that, um, that learning outcome. 
we only have three more minutes, but I have one last question. You guys said that there was a lot that you guys didn't necessarily agree on or you had to have discussions about was determining those 10 learning outcomes one of the harder things to agree on? Uh, no. I feel like that was actually one of the easier things. <laughs> yeah. We, though, I think that there are two points of, of where we spend a lot of time. It was like, how do we come up with a grading scheme? And the other one was, how do we preempt uh, plagiarism? Um, and one of the problems, we have different views on this and that's the way it should be. But I, I see a lot of students that, uh, that try to, because there's, it's so easy to find solutions on the internet and copy and paste them into your own without being able to explain them. And I had to um, sort of just accept that um, you can get to the first two levels without us really worrying about it. But if you get to, the, uh, to, to level three where you're doing a video, we will catch you if you haven't understood it at the first two levels. And um, according to Tasha, that's working out really well. So I'm gonna go along with that. Yeah, and it's virtually impossible for a student to be able to um, plagiarize a video, right? Unless they get the same voice actor to create all of their videos for them throughout the term. And especially if you have any interaction with them in person, you can tell if it's somebody else. I have a question. Yes. So uh, I'm trying to, to wrap my head around how I could do this for a chemistry course because so much of the, the information is uh, it's building upon earlier information. So I'm wondering how to like st stratify this idea of like, um, you know, how have you met the, the goals of the course, but then also how do you obtain mastery but also like keeping the timeline going so that they're going through all of the material and getting all that they need. Um, was that something that you guys had to deal with in this course? It sounds like the GSI is more uh, buildable, if that makes sense, but I- Actually, a lot of our material did build on earlier material in the course. Okay. But one of the nice things about that is that as students are working on later material, they're gaining a better understanding of earlier material. So even if they didn't quite have the confidence or knowledge to explain things in a video right. in week two, right, they've continued to work with that concept. And now it gets to week five and something clicks and they go, oh, now I can, I can explain that in the video and actually demonstrate this proficiency. And you didn't find that students that were trying to go back to um, to modify older material or taking away from learning new material? So in, in our synchronous class sessions, we were always working on new material. Okay. And so students did have to work on old material on their own time. Gotcha. But at least with the standards-based grading, they had incentive to work on the old material. Whereas in previous courses, what, I mean, we haven't taught this particular course before, obviously, but in previous courses, when we've moved on to new material, students have just sort of said, eh, too bad, and they don't look at the old material. And I, then I, when they're missing skills, that's tough. We got to go. Yeah, we got to go. We got to let Cara oh. talk about.